program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. The Speaker has summoned the Assembly to meet today for the purpose of conducting the items of business that appear on the order paper. The first item of business is the election of the Speaker and Deputy Speakers. Section 39.1 of the Northern Ireland Act provides that each Assembly shall as its first business, elect from among its members a presiding officer and deputies. Therefore, the Assembly cannot conduct any further business until a Speaker and at least two deputy speakers have been elected. Members should be clear, without the election of a Speaker and two deputies, no further business can proceed. I wish to advise members that the election of the Speaker will be conducted under the procedures set out in Standing Order 4. Further to Standing Order 4.2, I am the Acting Speaker today for the purpose of electing a Speaker. I will begin by asking for nominations. Any member may rise to propose that another member is elected as Speaker. I will then ask for the proposal to be seconded by another member as required by Standing Order 14. I will then verify that the member seconded is willing to accept the nomination. I will then ask for further proposals and follow the same procedure for each. When it appears that there are no further proposals, I will make it clear that the time for proposals has passed. If members indicate that they wish to speak, a debate relevant to the election may then take place, during which members will have up to five minutes to speak. At the conclusion of the debate, or the conclusion of the nominations, if there are no requests to speak, I shall put the question that the member first proposed shall be Speaker of this Assembly. The vote will be on a cross-community basis. If the proposal is not carried, I shall put the question in relation to the next nominee, and so on until all nominations are exhausted. Once the Speaker is elected, all other nominations will fall autom automatically. Do I have any proposals for the Office of Speaker of this Assembly? I call Mr. Beattie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Mike Nesbitt, MLA. Do I have a seconder for Mr. Nesbitt? I will second that. And can the member verify that he accepts the nomination? I accept. Thank you. Mr. O'Toole? No, Patsy McLoon, MLA. Do I have a seconder for Mr. McLoon? I second. Right. Mr. McLoon is unable to be in the chamber today. Standing Order 4.3 provides that a member may be nominated whether or not present, and the candidate proposed may accept the nomination by making a written statement to that effect. I can confirm that the Speaker has received written notification from Mr. McLoone that he is willing to accept 
nomination for the office of Speaker. Is there any other further proposal? Okay, uh, the, since there hasn't been any further proposals, I, I rule that the time for proposals has expired. So a number of members have indicated that they wish to speak. I would remind members that they may speak only once in the course of the debate, and members have up to five minutes in which to speak. So I call um, uh, Michelle Neelan. Thank you. Mr. Acting Speaker, today we meet for the fifth time since May to try to elect a Speaker to reinstate this Assembly and to allow MLAs mandated by the electorate to represent and work here on their behalf and to get on with the job. As we meet in the comfort of this well heated and well lit building, I'm very acutely aware that there are tens of thousands of families that are living in cold homes, unable to afford to turn on their heating and who are worried about the next bill coming through the doors as we face into the most difficult winter in a generation. And outside of those family homes, our health service is in crisis, and the healthcare workers are being forced to take strike action for uh, safe working conditions and decent pay to defend themselves and the wider health service. And it's an absolute disgrace that they're being forced into that position. Yesterday, we were in London, and we met with the leadership of the Royal College of Nurses to hear the plight of our nurses. And I want to send solidarity and support to the nurses from this assembly today and to the other health and public sector workers also. They have our full support and I think I speak for most of the people in this assembly and call on the British government and the, peop the people who, who do have the purse strings to immediately get around the negotiating table and get on with the resolution. So the Secretary of State has now brought the executive formation bill through Westminster to extend the deadline to, re to form a government or to hold an election. He's now given decision makers to civil servants and he has cut MLA pay. He has set out a budget statement and will bring forward an unadulterated Tory budget bill also. And whilst they're spending all this time trying to find workarounds, the real question is how are they using the space that they have now created to get a negotiated settlement with the EU to restore the executive and put to the test the DUP's boycott? I was in the Dáil last Thursday when European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen addressed the parliamentarians the length and breadth of this island. And she said that Brexit will not become an obstacle to reconciliation in Ireland, that the single market must continue to function, and if both sides are sensitive to this careful balance, a deal can be done, and that there will be no hard border on the island. She also said that our contacts with Prime Minister Richie Sunak are encouraging. I once more welcome, welcome this contact, but I go further than that, and I appeal for negotiations to be intensified. We do not have months to ponder, but rather weeks to take action that creates stability and certainty for society, businesses and politics. We cannot be left to the mercy of the Tories in London, people who are dictating the priorities here when they have no votes and no mandate here. And already we are starting to see the consequences of having no executive. Education services being cut with new services being targeted, with job losses and reduced provision now being imposed against the wishes of elected MLAs. And it's clear for us all to see that the DUP's political tactic is to abandon our people to a Tory government intent on inflicting cuts and austerity on the most vulnerable in our society. And that strategy, if it can even be called a strategy, makes no sense and it has no purpose. Incredibly, it's apparently a strategy dictated by a handful of loyalist bloggers. Geoffrey Donaldson, of course, is not here. He's not here with us despite the fact that he was elected to sit here. But I want to appeal again to him and to the DUP MLAs who have come to this sitting. Rethink your approach, reconsider your position, and most of all, recognise, recognise the dire and deteriorating circumstances that people, your voters, your voters, all of our voters are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. The crisis in our emergency departments, the cuts to youth services, the very real prospect of the cold faced by many of our people, particularly the old and the very young and those with disabilities. People need our help. They need us to do our jobs and they are rightly angry. Each one of these challenges that we face demands new thinking from us as elected representatives. 
demands a responsible and mature political response to help people right now who are desperate, desperate to see the end of the DUP boycott of politics. By any objective measure, everyone knows that the protocol is working and that it's protecting our economy from some of the worst effects of Brexit. We need to focus on the opportunities that it presents, dual market access, and how that can create benefits and create more jobs in building our economy. And of course, the members opposite disagree with that, and that's okay. You're entitled to disagree with that. But whatever about our different opinions on the protocol, we all know that any of these issues that have been identified relating to the protocol will not be resolved in this chamber. Last week, I welcomed, as I said, the comments by the Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, and she restated again the willingness of the Commission to resolve the issues when, with, and how the protocol is applied. We all want these issues to be resolved, but in the meantime, we're elected to be here in this chamber to have people's backs, to get the £600 out into their pockets. They are crying out for help. They need us to do our job. They elected us to do our job. So I call on you again. You should be ashamed of yourselves in this chamber today. The public need our support. Do your job. Turn up. Uh, I call Gordon Lyons. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Speaker. And the recall of this assembly is nothing more than a farce. We know that it is a stunt. The public know that it is a stunt. And the other parties know that it is a stunt as well, because many of them have told us so uh, privately. And so it should come as no surprise to the House that the DUP will not be supporting either of the nominees for Speaker today. We believe that devolution needs a firm foundation to succeed. And that foundation will never be in place as long as the issues around the protocol are unresolved. Now, I recognise that it does have, this sitting does have a special benefit for Sinn Féin, as it provides a useful distraction from the proceedings at the Special Criminal Court in Dublin, where it has been alleged that Sinn Féin have used a criminal gang for money and votes. Now, I'm sure many others Many others will be surprised, like me, to hear there could be connections between Sinn Féin and criminals. But of course, this needs a proper investigation uh, and to ensure that no gangland money is being used to influence politics here. But Mr Acting Speaker, I do recognise the dire situation that many people find themselves in. Many people are struggling with the cost of living. But on this, I agree with the former finance minister that the levers which can make the biggest difference sit with the UK government. Not my words, the words of the former finance minister, which he said in July in a letter to the former chancellor, along with Scottish and Welsh colleagues. I'll, I'll give away on that point. I thank the member for, for giving way. Would the member agree with me that one organisation certainly not suffering from a cost of living crisis is that of Connolly House? an organisation which continues to be one of the largest landlords on this island, an organisation which continues to host champagne receptions across the globe, and an organisation which continues to inherit millions of pounds apparently found down the back of a sofa in a caravan. An extra minute. Well, absolutely, I do agree. There's not going to be any shortage of uh, funds or shortage of heat in Connolly House uh, this winter. Of course, the, the member neglects to mention the £10 million of public money that they have received for their MPs uh, not taking their seats uh, at Westminster. And, of course, um, many of the pension pots uh, that Sinn Féin members will have built up uh, during their time working for MI5 uh, as well. Uh, so, um, in terms of uh, cost of uh, living, uh, the UK government uh, has been able to deliver additional payments for those on low incomes, additional support for pensioners through the increased winter fuel payments, and the energy price guarantee, which in some cases has cut electricity bills by up to uh, 50%. However, it is up to them to finally deliver the energy bills support scheme. This was a scheme that was devised uh, by Westminster, promised by Westminster, and now needs to be delivered uh, by Westminster as well, because in the summertime, there was a way forward and a mechanism identified for delivery. Energy suppliers and the utility regulator worked hard to put that in place. And at the last minute, the government has now started to consider alternative options. That is what is causing delay. That is a shame. And they need to get on with delivering the scheme that they had brought forward. The time for dithering is over. They have the money. 
They have the systems, they have the capacity to deliver this, and they need to get on with it. And I would hope that the other parties would join with us in calling for that to be delivered uh, as soon uh, as possible, because they are the ones that have the tools. And that is key for this conversation that we are having today. I'll give way to whoever has asked. But he gave the public assurances that these payments would come in November. And it's not any other party in this chamber that fell for Conservative dishonesty. It was the party to my right. And my constituents are now in a worse position because they have budgeted on the assumption that they will receive that money pre-Christmas and are now in a dire situation. That's thanks to DUP dishonesty. And it's not the first time there's been dishonesty about the protocol, about cardiac equipment, about Christmas trees, and now about support payments. When will the DUP accept responsibility? for their hand in placing us in this position where we are subject to Tory chaos and our constituents are suffering. Discussed. The government were the ones that said they were going to deliver this. It is up to them to deliver it. And we will continue to push the government on this uh, at Westminster. What we will not do is we will not say that we can deliver things that are not in our gift to deliver. We're not going to be like uh, the SDLP who have made People think that it is within their gift to deliver a thousand litres of home heating oil to every home in Northern Ireland. I'm not going to be like Sinn Féin and Michelle O'Neill, who repeatedly told us that there were hundreds of millions of pounds in a Stormont bank account just ready to go into people's pockets. And Sinn Féin today still haven't been able to accept that there are difficult choices ahead and that if we were an executive right now, we too would have to be making difficult decisions. So there is a need for people to be straightforward uh, and to be honest. So this sitting is a farce, everybody knows it, but it does provide us with one useful benefit. It prevents, uh, pr provides us once more with the opportunity to say clearly to the government and the European Union that this issue must be resolved. Threatening an election doesn't change anything, cutting salaries doesn't change anything, but what will unlock devolution is getting the protocol sorted, restoring Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market, and removing the democratic deficit. When that happens, we will not be found wanting. We will elect a speaker and we will nominate ministers. So we say to the UK and the EU, the ball is in your court, the clock is ticking, get on with it. Uh, can, I, can I just, before I call the next speaker, I just remind all members that interventions are not an opportunity to make speeches. So I just ask you to all to bear that in mind this morning. Thank you. Um, I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Today, if we manage to elect a speaker and go on to elect an executive, then the motion, the subject of today's recall, will be answered. We can all get back to work put our collective force together and create a solution to enable the £600 energy support payment to go out to old households. But Mr Acting Speaker, sadly from what I've heard today um, and the use of the cross-community voting in this place, I do not expect the DUP to end its boycott and I expect every household in Northern Ireland to face a cold winter without the same level of help that is being provided to others across the UK. The DUP's 2022 manifesto says now is not the time for more division and uncertainty. Yet here we are, a house divided and constituents facing uncertainty as to how they will pay for oil to heat their homes. I say to each of the DUP members, MLA colleagues in this house today, now is not the time for division and uncertainty. End your boycott. Using fellow citizens as leverage is not working. Our health service is crumbling and many health staff will be heading out on strike. Tackling the cost of living is being hampered, not helped by the DUP's boycott. Neil Deney in the newsletter reported on a statement made by the homeless sector this week as part of Homeless, Homelessness Awareness Week. And I quote, in a joint statement, the Chartered Institute of Housing, Homelessness Connect, NIFA and Housing Rights have expressed concern regarding the delays of the £600 energy bill payment, which will now not reach consumers in Northern Ireland until after Christmas. I will give way. Does the member agree with me that we've just heard a speech from the former caretaker minister that he was effectively defending the undefensible? The reality is that uh, he made promises not to this House, which he should have done, but he made promises to the citizens and people of Northern Ireland about payments for fuel, and that he, has, he and his party are blocking and have completely and utterly failed to deliver that fuel, fuel 
urgently needed fuel cost to citizens across Northern Ireland. People will be freezing in Northern Ireland because of your actions, former minister. The member shall have an extra minute. Thank you. Um, and to continue on with the, the piece that was in the newsletter, households here are being failed by the ongoing lack of financial support to help with increased energy costs. Continuing delays to the scheme being rolled out are unconscionable, particularly given the, that households in England, Scotland and Wales have rightly been in receipt of support since October of this year. Our members and tenants and communities we work with are already being impacted by significant pressures on their households' budgets, and the delay in this payment further compounds this. Our members report increased instances where people are sitting in cold homes this winter. Mr Acting Speaker, neither your constituents, nor my constituents, nor any constituents in Northern Ireland have received any part of the £600 energy support payment because the DUP continue to use them as leverage in their polit political game with Westminster. It is very clear, Westminster is in no rush to sort out this payment. Northern Ireland was never going to be able to opt into a GB energy payment scheme. It was always going to require a bespoke approach because Northern Ireland has a different regulator, system and companies. Northern Ireland is more dependent on oil for home heating. Originally, the payment was supposed to come through the Barnet Consequentials, and if a local scheme had been progressed earlier this year, I have no doubt we would not be in this dreadful situation. Mr Graham Stewart, MP, made it very clear in the Commons the energy issue is a devolved issue. He said, we are acutely aware of the situation facing households in Northern Ireland. Of course, what they most need is good government in Northern Ireland for and by the people of Northern Ireland. It is the failure to have that executive in this devolved area of responsibility that is at the heart of this issue. And he continued, looking forward, the people of Northern Ireland need a period of good government and future prosperity. Westminster did not intentionally delay the scheme. I put it to this House that the DUP dropped the ball. I would love to see some payment in some format before Christmas. I th think it is unacceptable for people in poverty to have to wait until January, while the rest of the UK is insulated from the worst effects of crisis. Alliance want, Alliance want to see Westminster proceed with electricity credits before Christmas and for them to continue to work on a cash back option in parallel. This could look like providing the original £400 credit on bills pre-Christmas with £200 cash, cash out option to follow as soon as possible. Mr Speaker, I go out regularly across my constituency surveying people asking what their key issues are. The first that they tell us is get the £600 out to households, and the second is get the executive back to work. Today I will be voting for the proposed speakers because I want this place back to work. Today the DUP has a choice. Elect a speaker and let us all get on with helping constituents in Northern Ireland, or continue your boycott and leave constituents in the cold this winter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas to you all. Um, it's warm in here, isn't it? Bit of a shame that many of our people out are sitting in their homes right now cold. Many businesses looking at their energy bills and saying they're just not going to be able to survive this winter. Many service providers wondering what they can cut just to provide the basic level of service. Warm in here, isn't it? That £600 energy support scheme would have helped other people be warm also. Yet I stand here knowing that this recall peti petition is gesture politics, and it's gesture politics which is born out of frustration. I just, just do not see what we gain from hurling insults across the Assembly floor while others suffer with the cost of living crisis. Because the reality is this. Like three years before, with Sinn Féin, the DUP simply do not care. They do not care about people being hungry. They do not care about people being cold. They don't care about waiting lists. They don't care services are being undermined. They don't care nurses are going on strike. They don't care some of our most vulnerable older people are going to die cold and hungry. The DUP care about the DUP and taking votes back off the TUV. That's all they care about. They 
and Sinn Féin are two sides of the same damn coin. They have shared champagne breakfast together, done overseas trips together for the last 16 years, and they have pushed Northern Ireland into the dirt for their own political gain. Mandate. Mandate. I'm sick to death of hearing the word mandate. If your mandate is not for 1.9 million people who are on this island, on this, in Northern Ireland, who work, we work for, then you're an absolute busted flush. We have to work for all of our people. I'm sick of it. Sick of the word mandate. The protocol was a bad deal, and it was a bad deal which was facilitated by the DUP. It undermined the UK territorial integrity in 2019, and it undermines the UK territorial integrity now. But handing all the power to those who brought in the protocol is absolutely crazy. The Northern, the Northern Ireland Protocol will be dealt with through negotiation between the UK and the EU, or it will be dealt with by legislation. Whether we have an executive up and running or not will not change that fact. Anyone who tells you the collapse of the executive brought anybody to the negotiating table are telling you lies. Global forces brought them back to the negotiating table. The cost of the protocol brought them back to the negotiating table, not by having this. So while some today sitting in this chamber will feel good about themselves because they're able to raise this issue, the reality is the people out there will still suffer. And there are good people out there. And there are good people in here. And there are good people in the DUP. And I know you don't want to do that. And I know you think you can scream and whinge and whine like a girl from the sidelines. That's up to you. That's up to you. But I will not, I will not, I will not be bullied. I will not be bullied. Order and point of order. Mr. Speaker, and the House will be aware of Mr. Beatty's history when it comes to misogyny. But I'm just wondering, is it in order? Uh, Mr. Acting Speaker, to use such language in relation to women in this chamber. Thank you. The, the, the member is perfectly entitled to say whatever he wishes. Thank you. Carry on. Thank you. Um, I, and do you know what, Mr. Speaker? I, I'm a big enough man to say when I get something wrong, I got it wrong, and I will apologise because I got it wrong. Because I got it wrong. Because I used a, 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 a terminology. But it's exactly the same is that they sit and they think they can barrack you and bully you into doing something where well, they're simply not going to. We're not going to. We will have this executive up and running, and we will provide for the people of Northern Ireland, regardless. It's as simple as that. It will happen. Because we will get to the same place on the protocol whether we have an executive or not. The difference being is the people will suffer because of it. Mr Speaker, thank you. I call uh, Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Speaker, and thank you for once again taking the chair as we seek, uh, it looks like, once again in vain to elect uh, a speaker. And I'm moving again the nomination of, of Patsy McGloon. He's accepted that nomination, though he's not here uh, in person because of a prior um, commitment. Mr Acting Speaker, I um, have a five-year-old child who uh, I was uh, helping get packed up for school today. And like lots of other parents, we are using uh, the fact that Christmas is approaching um, uh, as a tool to help teach our children responsibility. And when you're trying to teach responsibility, uh, one of the key things is trying to get your child to take accountability and responsibility for their actions. And when it comes to taking responsibility and accountability for your actions, surely people who should be willing to take responsibility and accountability for their actions more than anyone else are those of us who walk around people's doors and ask for power, because with power has to come responsibility. When you seek power, when you seek election, you seek power in order to hopefully make people's lives better, but also in order to take responsibility for leading them, for ensuring that they have proper governance 
for ensuring that they have public services that work, for ensuring that at a time of a cost of living emergency, in which inflation is at double digit levels, in which people, my constituents, everyone's constituents, the DUP's constituents, are sitting in cold homes so that those people can have a modicum of support. The tragedy is that the DUP is addicted to power but hates responsibility. The DUP wants the power of being able to assert a tribal veto over progress in this place, of being able to say, unless this happens on our terms, it's not going to happen at all. They seek that power, they assert that power as they've done in the chamber today. Multiple of their members have said, what about our mandate? What about the power that we got from the electorate? But they refuse to take responsibility, responsibility for leading people, for helping people in a cost of living emergency. And it's absolutely disgraceful, Mr. Acting Speaker. Always shirking, always deflecting. It's always someone else's fault. And multiple DUP speakers, and I'm sure further on, later on today, will make the point that, well, for three years, Sinn Féin uh, brought the executive down. There'll be debates about the precise chronology between 2017 and 2020. But that was wrong then. That was wrong for exactly the same reasons that what you're doing is wrong now, even though the circumstances are slightly different. I will happily give way for the sake of debate to Mr. Buckley. Thank you to the member for giving way. And if he is consistent on that point in saying that it was wrong to hold the institutions down for three years, when the Bengoa report, for example, was produced, the health minister in post was then Michelle O'Neill, not published, sat on a shelf. Why then did the SDLP not call for the restoration of devolved assembly? And on that point, why did they help facilitate that boycott by Sinn Féin by actually walking out the door with them? Can he explain or at least be consistent in his position? Way for precisely this reason, Mr Acting Speaker, so that the DUP representative could assert exactly this. It's tribal one-upmanship. That's what it's always about. It's always about the old saying from the movies, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Well, when life gives you lemons, you chuck it back across the chamber. It doesn't matter about people's cold homes. It doesn't matter about public services, because lemons did it. Lemons did it. Of course point of order, Mr. Butler. Sorry, sorry Mr. O'Toole. Of course we did. Uh, point of order from Mr. Butler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. In the last Assembly debate, there was an incredible amount of chuntering and bickering going on in this chamber, and I couldn't hear what the, the member speaking was saying. And the chuntering in this instance, that instance was coming from this side of the chamber. In this instance, it's coming from this side of the chamber. I don't think it's appropriate, especially given what the debate's about t today, the pressures that are on the general public in Northern Ireland. Uh, could you make a ruling that, that, that the chuntering and, and speaking is kept to a minimum, regardless of where it comes from, and allow the speakers to make their points? Here, here. Mr. Speaker. A point of order was previously made, Mr. Speaker, uh, about the, the general tenor of the debate in this chamber, but I want to make a specific point of order request to you, Mr. Speaker. One of the Speaker's rulings very clearly is that members should not engage from a sedentary position. A member on this side of the House has done that for consistently in an argument with the member who had the right to stand on the floor, and I expect a Speaker's ruling about in, uh, involving themselves in a the debate from a sedentary position. I would ask all members uh, to behave with dignity and respect. The public are watching this. We don't get many opportunities and haven't had many opportunities to come into this chamber to debate. And if the level of the debate descends to what it could, uh, it's not going to set a very good example uh, to, to the public. So please, I want to hear the speakers. The public want to hear the speakers. Hansard wants to hear the speakers. But so please, I would ask respect when a speaker is on their, on their feet, let them speak, and, and let's not have any yelling from the sidelines, as it were. Please. Mr. Acting Speaker, this institution was created and founded on the basis of common endeavour, putting aside differences in order to work together for the common good. That's what I want to do. Whenever bills arrive in the post, whenever meters tick towards zero, they don't say unionist or nationalist or other on them. People are in cold homes. Those homes aren't unionist, nationalist or other. Operating tribal veto, trying to achieve tribal victory, is not a way to help people through this crisis. So I appeal to the DUP sincerely, sincerely, I, even as I appeal sincerely, I'm kind of getting sceptical and, and kind of chuntering from, I genuinely, sincerely, 
this isn't a game. No, this really isn't a game, I'm afraid, Mr Lyons, the Minister, who, you know, you did promise people some months ago that they would have money. They don't have it, and they're in cold homes. So this isn't a game. This institution is about common endeavour. It's about working together. It's about serving the people who we asked for a vote from in May. And I'm afraid if we keep going down this road, if we keep, keep bringing this place down in order to assert a tribal veto, then all we do is fundamentally damage people's trust in the status quo, not just in the constitutional status quo, but in the ability of democracy to deliver for people. That's an extraordinarily damaging and dangerous thing to do. So sincerely, genuinely, honestly, looking at DUP colleagues across the chamber, who I genuinely think in their heart of hearts do care about their constituents. I think you do, but please, genuinely, seriously, you want power, you've got it. Now, please, take responsibility. Paul, uh, Jim Alistair. Uh, Acting Speaker, on this, the 7th of December, exactly 100 years ago, in 1922, the elected unionist representatives to the predecessor of this House, the Northern Ireland Parliament, on that very day, unanimously declined to leave the Union of the United Kingdom and to join the Irish Free State. One hundred years later, it remains the unanimous view of every unionist elected representative that the protocol is unacceptable because of the manner and extent to which it dissipates and disrespects that very same union. That fundamental has not changed and will not change for those of us who are, by conviction, unionists. But what is the union? Well, David Trimble quite rightly said, it's the Acts of Union. What do they do? Well, whether it was the 1707 Act of Union with Scotland or the 1800 Act of Union, they created a union of the United Kingdom which was based on two premises, a political union, a parliamentary union, where you created a single sovereign parliament and an economic union whereby you created a single market, an economic union, a single trading area, which was the United Kingdom. And that, of course, was premised upon Article 6 of the Acts of Union. Last week, I sat in the Supreme Court listening to Her Majesty's government barrister, and barristers only speak upon instructions, arguing that the protocol, and in so arguing he confirmed everything that we have ever said about it, that the protocol disapplies Article 6 of the Acts of Union. What does disapply mean? It's pretty obvious what it means. It sets it aside, overrides it, subjugates it. We can all understand that. But what does it do? It takes that key component of the Act of Union, that of the Economic Union, and, and sets it aside and says it no longer applies. There no longer is a single market in the United Kingdom. There no longer is the freedom to trade without, unfettered between and within the all of the United Kingdom. And indeed, it goes further than that because it says GB is now a foreign country whose goods must be checked coming to Northern Ireland. And that, of course, is the fundamental reason why no unionist can ever operate institutions which by law would be required to implement such a protocol, to accept that GB is a foreign country, to accept there must be checks on its goods, to accept that we must be subject to foreign laws we don't make and can't change. And that is the fundamental essence of the reason why the protocol can never be accepted. Yes, okay, boy. I thank the member for giving way. And to add insult to injury in relation to the protocol, we have language such as last week from Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, comparing Britain's actions in Ireland to that of the Ukraine. How the irony is not lost that uh, Britain has led the way in supporting Ukraine in its actions from the dictators in Russia. The member is absolutely right, but that is the, that's now the ground rules. 
of the operation of devolution in Northern Ireland. That, that is the fundamental premise upon which devolution now has to operate. And that is a premise that can never be bearable or acceptable by any unionist. The truth is, the sad truth is, that the protocol achieved what the IRA and all their murderous campaign could never achieve, a border in the Irish Sea, the suspension of a significant part of the active union. Whether it was their murder 39 years ago of the very talented Edgar Graham 39 years ago today, or the callous kidnapping 50 years ago today of Jean McConville, for all that murderous attack, the IRA never achieved what the protocol achieved. And then there are those in this House who think that unionists should just sub it up. It's not going to happen because we are defending the very fundamentals of the union when we resist and reject the protocol uh, in that regard. So let's be very clear. A protocol which requires unionists to operate an assembly and to conduct as ministers on the basis that GB is a foreign country is not going to operate with the consent of unionists. And if there are others, be they the government, be they the EU, be they the American president, be the other MLAs who want an assembly to operate, then they need to recognize and accept that reality. It is not going to operate on the basis that GB is a foreign country, that Article 6 of the Act of Union has been disapplied, and that we are being disenfranchised from within the union that we believe. And unless and until those who fail to face up to that reality do face up to it, then this assembly, quite rightly, is going nowhere. Thank you. I call Jerry Carl. Mr. Acton, Speaker, I have to admit that today's political circus may be amusing if the cost of living crisis wasn't so deep or if the outcome of the proceedings today weren't so predictable. Um, through this sitting, this sitting might carry some intrigue for the press, workers on the picket lines, patients lying in hospitals, corridors, and everyone struggling may ask, what's the point? Kids Together and Salos, who I met this morning, who have been denied access to youth service funding effectively because they work with and support children with disabilities, may also ask, what's the point? The DUP's impervious attitude to people's plight is obvious. So there is some justification in asking, what's the point in pleading with a party that has allowed people to go hungry, whole households to freeze, and whole communities to suffer for its own ends? Just as everyone knows, the DUP won't vote for Speaker. They also know, Acting Speaker, that the DUP's outrage about the protocol is manufactured. Edwin Poots' embarrassing attempt to change the protocol bill proves that point in and of itself. Their political credibility and vote is plummeting, so the DUP has reverted to the familiar tactic of stoking intercommunal tensions to shore up their own base. And while the DUP refuses to govern, their one-time allies, allies in the Tory party have decided to inflict more misery on people in the North. That same party that indulged the DUP's boycott of the Assembly from the outset, first with the Protocol Bill and then by re-entering negotiations with the European Union, and after failing with the carrot, the Secretary of State is now trying with the stick. We have had election threats, budget cuts and finally a threat to introduce water charges and to punish ordinary people um, and transigents of the DUP. But make no mistake, Acting Speaker, the Tories also want us to pick up the bill for their September budget, which promised handouts to the wealthy and misery for the rest. This is a government of the rich and for the rich, which has always been about making ordinary people pay for its mistakes. But these threats against working class communities could be the last resort of an administration that has absolutely no plan whatsoever to deal with the crisis that exists here. The Stormont is fundamentally broken, and neither the Tories nor the political establishment here have the desire to fix it. Besides exacerbating the cost of living crisis, the DUP is simply exercising the sectarian veto on power sharing that is enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. These political institutions, built and run on the basis of communal divisions and designations, have failed Catholic, Protestant and neither. And after 25 years of failure, 
Serious questions are looming about whether this place could or should be resurrected at all. People are all too aware of how these sectarian structures were used to deny same-sex marriage, reproductive rights, Irish language rights and the broad democratic desires of the public. And unfortunately, the communal carve-up has been no barrier to things like welfare reforms, public sector pay cuts and corrupt schemes like RHI and Red Sky. Um, later, maybe. Uh, people for profit will support the election of a speaker as a stopgap measure today. However, we recognise that resurrecting Stormont will not solve the cost of living crisis itself or deliver on the long term hopes and aspirations of the majority here. As in the past, it will be for the public to pressure any new executive to act in their interests. And if, if, if this Assembly is not restored, then I believe that denial of democracy should be met with democracy and a border poll should be called within two years and people should be given a say in reshaping this island for the benefit of the many, not the DUP or the economic elites on this island. Illusions and Stormont are waning, Mr Acting Speaker, and whether this Assembly is restored or not, working class people who are and have been crushed by this crisis will not wait for politicians to get their house in order. We only have to look at the example of our health workers who are striking to defend our NHS in coming days and who will remember that the previous executive was content to offer them a pay cut in real terms. Our postal workers, housing executive workers, BT workers, university workers and countless others are also forging ahead without Stormont. They are fighting to ensure their demands for a better future are heard wherever they need to be heard. And to be clear, Acting Speaker, I believe that Stormont, if Stormont is restored in its current guise, then further crises will come. Uh, the sectarianism at the heart of the state guarantees it. We are fast approaching the point where, given the choice, people may call time on this farce because you can't paper over the cracks of an assembly that is crumbling at its foundations. All things considered, Mr. Acting Speaker, people may ask, still ask, what's the point in taking a seat up in this broken assembly or me speaking here today? And for me, the point is simple. As long as me or socialists have a voice in these chambers, then we will use them to amplify the voices of workers, of social movements and whole parties like the DUP and the Tories to account. And whether the DUP votes for a speaker or not today, it's important that they hear the disastrous consequences of their actions. And finally, we like to say in solidarity to every worker out in strike uh, this coming weeks. Today may be about the DEP, but tomorrow it's about you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I call Alex Easton. Um, thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Um, Mr. Acting Speaker, I, I despair at the political maturity and debate in this place and the hypocrisy that comes from some parties who, in my opinion, are only interested in point scoring and playing games and are not really interested in the lives of the people of Northern Ireland, no matter what section of the community that they claim to represent. Um, when we look at the facts, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, Sinn Féin have brought down the Assembly and they did it for three years and they did it for several reasons. They did it because of the, the RHI scandal and indeed because they wanted an Irish Language Act, uh, an Irish Language Act where only 5% of the population actually can speak Irish to some degree. But during those three years, Sinn Féin didn't care less about our education system. They didn't care less about our health system. They didn't care less about our wildlife. They didn't care less about our policing system. They didn't care less about our infrastructure and roads. They didn't care less about our security. They didn't care less in those three years about our housing. In those three years, they didn't care less about jobs and they certainly didn't care less about the welfare of our people. And ironically, Sinn Féin support the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yet, when we look at the Northern Ireland Protocol, what's the Northern Ireland Protocol doing for Northern Ireland? It's costing businesses extra money. It's costing businesses extra paperwork. It's denying the rights of the citizens of Northern Ireland the right to the same goods in many places that they get in the rest of the United Kingdom. In fact, it's actually driven up prices. So when Sinn Féin say that uh, they care about the cost of living and the energy crisis now, they certainly don't care less about the crisis and the amount of money, sorry, no. They do not care less about the increase in costs that the Northern Ireland Protocol is putting on the people of Northern Ireland. They couldn't care less. So you're hypocrites, you're total hypocrites. And when we look at our own government in Westminster, who are also playing with the lives of the people of Northern Ireland 
in terms of costs. Um, because they know that the cost of living payments and the energy payments, they can get those out to the people of Northern Ireland just like that if they wanted to. And they have a responsibility in resolving that as well. Because when we look at our assembly and before the assembly collapsed, we see that there was very little that we could have actually done to help people because this assembly was in debt to 600 million pounds, which the finance minister allowed to happen before he left office. So where were we going to get any money to help people with their energy costs? Where were we going to get any money to help people with their heating? Where were we going to get money to help people afford food? We couldn't because we didn't have the money because we were that in debt. Yet you all sit around here pretending that we were going to do fantastic things. We weren't because we couldn't afford it. No. What people need to realize is that whether we like it or not, the Northern Ireland Protocol is a serious issue and it's a serious issue for the unionist population and it is. And I can see some of my colleagues and the Ulster Unionist bench is actually shaking their head that they're not, and some of them are agreeing that it is. But until we get that sorted out, this place ain't coming back. And there is a responsibility on all the political parties in here to be talking to each other because you don't, all you do is shout at each other. And it doesn't matter which side of the divide you claim to come from, or who you support, or if you claim you're in the middle. You actually, no, I won't. Because you actually, because you actually don't meet. You actually don't support each other. You, don't, you aren't willing to listen to the points of view of other people. No, I won't. No, because I listen to you all the time and you achieve nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> and even more depressing, when we see the lack of negotiations that are going on between Westminster and the EU, we see uh, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol bill going through Westminster. Westminster could have had that fast tracked, and they haven't. So they're causing part of the problem that we have here today. So in reality, as much as I want to help the people... Member bring his remarks to a conclusion, as, please. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. As much as I want to help the people of Northern Ireland, until there's political maturity from the rest of us in here, and Westminster and the EU stop playing games, we're not going to get anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. I call Conor Murphy. Can Corda, I had thought the DUP were out of dead cats at this stage, but uh, it seems we might need to alert the RSPCA in the time ahead. But let's get away from distraction politics and get real. In very challenging circumstances, the parties here worked together during COVID in the executive to help people through that particular crisis. And we should be working together now to help our people and businesses through this cost of living crisis. The DUP boycott of the executive is preventing that. And for what? We did not choose Brexit. The people of the North majority rejected Brexit, but it was imposed on us by the Tories and the DUPs. And as with any new trading relationship, there are issues that can and should be sorted out. But the boycott of our Assembly and the Executive by the DUP has had absolutely no impact on the negotiations which are between the EU and the British Government. The boycott instead is doing huge damage to our people, to our businesses and to our public services. When the DUP collapsed the Executive in February, the draft budget was out for consultation and I have no doubt that a final budget would have been agreed and would have provided the health service with an extra billion pounds. Just as importantly, it would have provided the certainty of a three-year budget. This would have allowed the Health Department to properly plan services, recruit more doctors and nurses, and give staff a pay increase. In the absence of an executive, health and other public services went from day to day, not knowing what their spending limit was. That financial chaos led departments to overspend. During the year, the executive received millions of pounds in additional money. This could have been used to help de with departmental pressures, to give public sector workers a pay rise and to help people and businesses with the cost of living crisis. Crucially, it would have been for an executive to decide how to use that money. Instead, the Tories are now imposing a budget which will mean a £330 million reduction in our finances next year. And there is no executive to set a public pay policy which could have offered a fair pay rise to nurses, teachers and other public sector workers who stepped up 
during the pandemic. Because the DUP went on strike on full pay, now public sector workers have to resort to industrial action to get the pay rise that they deserve. As well as walking out of the executive in the middle of a budget consultation, the DUP also downed tools in the mid middle of a deepening financial crisis. When we all knew families would need our help to heat their homes and put food on the table, that businesses would need help to keep their shutters up and to keep workers in a job. And we had the means to help people. The first tranche of money for the uh, energy support payment, around £160 million, came to the executive in February. The funding was given to the executive to deliver the scheme because it was the responsibility of the economy minister and his department to do that. Energy is a devolved matter. Given the urgency, I'm happy to give away. The member for Given Way, although he has spent quite a bit of money so far in, in, in what he has said, if only the executive were back. He said energy is a devolved issue. It absolutely is. But if that is the case, why is it that the energy price guarantee has been delivered here uh, in uh, Northern Ireland? And does he accept that the money that was originally given for the energy payments in February was a result of that money originally uh, being a loan? The fact is that the, the government had agreed and decided that we were the ones to deliver an energy scheme, just as we did on many occasions and many times during COVID. This executive received billions of pounds of additional payment and distributed that money quickly and directly to those most in need. That an executive in place would have instructed you, as the economy minister, to get a scheme in place very quickly to distribute that money. And there's no ducking, there is no ducking that issue. Despite the, despite the false promises, there is no ducking that issue. The fact that the DUP collapsed the executive meant that the funding could not be allocated. And to cover up their culpability for blocking the payment, the DUP made the false claim that the payment should have been delivered by the British government, regardless of whether an executive was in place. And they kept up that fiction for months while the money sat idle. Eventually, at a meeting in August, in which the economy minister and myself attended, the British government finally agreed to take responsibility for delivering the scheme. They did so reluctantly, and only because it was made clear by the DUP that they would continue to block an executive from delivering the scheme. The British government made clear the payment may not be made until after Christmas, despite the fact that Brit people in Britain were starting to receive that money in October. I was honest with the public about that. The DUP falsely promised people that they could expect that payment in November. Now the British government has confirmed only that payments will be made over the winter, whenever that may end. That delay is unacceptable. Cancorda, we've been told that the IT systems needed to make the £600 discount are ready to go. If that is the case, the executive could meet today, agree to the discount and transfer the money to the energy companies. So I ask the DUP, stop looking over your shoulder at those who want to live in the past and start looking after our people who are facing a really tough Christmas. Because while you go back to the comfort of your homes, your warm homes tonight, many of your constituents will be freezing. Let's work together to help them. Gordon Marbot. Thank you, Mr. Arklin, Speaker. I will try to keep my remarks relatively short, given what we have heard already, especially in relation to the cost of living crisis. And I think there is little else to be added to the core issue, our core issues of the debate. We have already thoroughly rehearsed the, frankly, devastating impacts of again failing to elect the Speaker today will have on our public services, the public purse, and on the individual lives of each of our constituents in the midst of a cost of living crisis, and also um, as well as on their confidence in how this institution supports and delivers for them. To be clear, back to the Speaker, the vote that will take place at the end of this debate is not a vote on who will sit in that chair you are currently occupying. Bluntly, I and my party colleagues do not actually care who that will be. We do know, however, that there are two very well-qualified candidates who have been put forward. We care only that someone will occupy that chair in order that we can reconvene Assembly business and conduct the jobs that we were elected to do, and that we can serve our constituents to the fullest of our ability. The vote, Acting Speaker, at the end of this debate will instead be on whether members care about the issues affecting our constituents and whether or not they care enough to prioritise those issues over party political interest and protest. I was going to say, Acting Speaker, that it would be shameful to prioritise party political interest over a health service that is collapsing around us and a climate crisis which is no longer a looming, a looming threat but is here and is happening now. But I'm starting to believe that the party to my right, the DUP, are incapable 
of shame. The rest of us, Acting Speaker, are aware of the global and local implications and repercussions of the issues I have mentioned, and we want to get on with it. As in every other, as in every other recall, we know what the outcome is likely to be, and it is utterly depressing. To put it in context, I have been a member of this Assembly for over four years. I have been afforded the opportunity to debate in this chamber and scrutinise on committee for a little over two years, and therein lies the problem. Acting Speaker, we should be looking urgently at the reform of these institutions. I am not going to go into the detail of that today, except to reiterate my and my party colleagues' strong commitment to allow all parties in this chamber to govern if they wish to do so. That is by far the best alternative to the current arrangements of recurring collapse and chaos. I would prefer that to be done on an inclusive basis, of course, but the point is that some parties who have had the opportunity to take up their seats in government have failed to do so. In the new arrangements, they could self-exclude if they so wished, but they should never, ever be able to prevent those of us who are willing to govern and deliver from doing so. It is called Choice Acting Speaker, and it is fair. I want to close by saying to my South Antrim political colleagues, and VUP in particular, to reflect on their position and appeal for them to do so. That is what I would advise, and I issue that advice based on very recent conversations, as recently as this morning in some cases, with food banks, businesses, schools, youth service providers that were mentioned earlier, NHS patients and waiting lists, and other constituents. Their need is greater than any need to use them as leverage for political point scoring or protest. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. As we meet here for the fifth time to try and elect a Speaker, this isn't the meeting of the Assembly that I or any of my party colleagues wants. I want to be standing here today to hold the Education Minister accountable on helping childcare providers struggling to stay open and the parents who are struggling to pay. I want to be questioning the Health Minister about how we can address the spread of Strep A throughout our communities and ask about the tragic circumstances around the emergency department in relation to little Stella Lilly. I want to be asking the Community Minister how they might be able to intervene to prevent the potential closure closure of Radio Foy. I want to be questioning the Economy Minister to explain why over 1,600 jobs were created in Belfast last year and only 67 were created in Derry. But none of that is possible. Therefore, I am unable to fully represent and serve the people of Foy. Because each time that we have to meet to nominate a Speaker, the DUP <coughs> refused to act. I think we can say that there's very little Christmas cheer around Stormont today, and certainly no Christmas miracle. The DUP will leave this building once again today, having refused to do their jobs, and once again expect their constituencies to foot the bill. I have no doubt that in the days ahead we'll hear the DUP politicians <coughs> going in onto the airwaves and defending their decision, defending how you stopped government here because you weren't getting your own way. I don't know how you have the nerve. But then again, I don't know how you have the nerve to do a lot of things. The nerve to be calling for a £600 payment scheme to be delivered from outside this chamber while you refuse to take your seats inside this chamber. The nerve to hold up government because you don't like the consequences of the political decision in 2016 that you campaigned for. The nerve to stand for election, sign up for your wages, but not take your seats. But let's really cut to the chase here and get to the truth for once. And I accept that the DUP has not been well accustomed to the truth in recent uh, times. But some of us still believe that it's important. The plain truth is, to anyone with eyes, that you have whipped up into a frenzy your people because you can't stomach being in second place finish. The truth is that you're holding those of us who want to actually get on with our jobs to ransom. 
Mr Acting Speaker, this isn't about us. This is about the leverage of ordinary people that the DUP is now exploiting. It's about how you're willing to stand idly by while people lose their jobs, while people struggle to pay their mortgage and to meet their childcare bills. People are rightly furious about that. <coughs> what angers them more than anything is that they can see that one party is able to hold up the rest of us. The most basic test of our politicians is just to show up. And yet one party is preventing us actually to do that. Would the member, the member agree with me and many in the healthcare uh, sector that it is undeniable that the lack of any real reform being instituted is costing people their lives. And the fact that some will not allow us to have an executive and a health minister means that out there people are dying and that they should reflect upon their actions in this place and the impact that it has on people in real terms in their homes. We'll have an extra minute. And absolutely agree with the member. And actually, that should be the impetus for all of us, if we even needed any, that we need to reform this place to take away the veto over progress that the DUP is so cruelly wielding um, against our people. In the 25th year of the Good Friday Agreement, our party stands ready to do that hard work. Each day that passes, we preside over failed politics. Our young people lose hope for their future and in this place. I still believe that investing in the mechanisms of inclusive democracy, where we share power rather than carve it up, is the only way to deliver for the people and the only way to give hope and honesty to the Good Friday Agreement. More and more people are looking at the dysfunction you are creating and they are turning towards something different. The DUP may, might be content for now whipping up fear over a new Ireland that would supposedly be hastened by a nationalist first minister or by a protocol. But the truth is that the real impetus for constitutional change is the arrogant boycott that you will no doubt continue today. Happy Christmas. Thank you. I call Aisling O'Reilly. Gormaya got a last young corla of his very may chance to Nicolti, Nicolishni Astra and a curse shock. Boy on Tush, a curl at our covroom, and Shaw or Benchy Hen Fein, Ogus Gakdin in Shaw's a co channel, a goal, the clan, Karja, Ogus Lagak Eleganya, a Roy Naku, or Matthew McCallum. Tars Munche, Lena Maher, a Aher, Ogus Levelig, Iganam Shaw. But while I'm forced to lose my girl, 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 be new and here lad the status of girl, then Billa hanga or goes at girlig mordly. As Kush Starl, Isha, Gwil and Billa freed or goes cousins again changa the gag denya a chias and odd or goes a tempunche lesson actors gijisha or goes a smarial or ratchet surak or gini arihe a new and ga or goes in tawak lesson Billa or goes in tlisha. Tamu jen kind shirt card the bonus ahanja or goes be Misha. August on Pubble Umlin Gaelic, a conyol Sul Yar, Kurave Mangeli, August Duel, Lishin, Kulia, Augustus Fager. So Shaw Rishmudge, a male and Gavri, August Kungrak, Dunnulug, a Rishik Chakla Kila, Lenar Nihalayanu, John Corlia Aronu, Dunkugu Ur, a John Shak Me, and Yedagini, Chakla Makamina Baltina, Lavota, a Kahi, Dunya. Dahin Mudjalig, August Mudjan or Shasu and Shaw. Shachas and the EUP is there. Gamil Chirli, August Ebri, Extrahalch, Ola Gola, La Hardy and Cossus Maraktala, August Asishin, Gujarak and Rod, a Taitachima Mak, Osar Gore, and you. Chirli Extrahalch, the Billy Funyev, Costasaha, Extrahalch, the Bea, a current tabla, August Extrahalch, Law, Sunuk. Tan Costas Maraktala, a Girinis Massa, August Gan Feminist, August Ari Achla and Ach, Ogin, and you, Lithaku, August Kodju Lesson Football. Neil Ian Award Dohus on Dagini. August Tadini Stibinchi and Shaw, Gijerakos Makor, Brass Asta Legans Dagini, Dark Arja, Dark Jolie, Dark Corsini, August Dark Pubble, Strachels, Law, Monarishiv. Yal and Tareg Namiak, the DUP are reached, August Arish Dalla, Amesha Nilig. Amesha Nilig, will it be an Irish? 
Gallant Tarig Namiakta DUP Arish Douglas Arishala, Gamel Shi Kid, the Ekyak, Takyakta, Ekchakta Gini, and Shaw and Minasuna. Neil McKencha and Rochera Nola, Seganam, Nakmech and Ektarli, Normal Shay Brass after Dini and Meet Rory, Akshan Wedger and Shakti La, Domina Nolog, August and Shay Kid Function, Nis Fuja Ogini, Namara V River, Eslair. Tamaji Clinton's initial realtors in the Bratania, Nakmeo, Chenik Techamamak, Gajian Vlianir, Bedger. Marialer and Jilti on DUP, Hak the Stack of the School Channel, Lavoni, Leparchiha Alla, Tashidic Blockel, and Tarigid, Shinik Golamak, or Andoris. Yes, please. My friend, uh, Mr. Butler, there wished to ask a question. And as my understanding of the joint translation process, he would be fully entitled to ask his question in English, and that would be translated into Irish, and then you'd be able to respond in Irish and back to English. The question when you, who made ever the statement who said, is the question going to be made in Irish, I think is more than a little bit disingenuous. And I don't think it is what was the intent was made by indeed my friend, Rob, Mr. Butler. Could I have a ruling on that, please, Mr. Deputy Speaker? The, the, the member certainly has made a point and it has been noted, but it is convention that the speaker uh, uh, on their feet have the, the right to refuse to take an intervention. So it's really down to the member whether they wish to take an intervention or not. Uh, would, would the chair, would the, the acting speaker address the point made by Mr. Aiken? Do the standing orders not now provide that an intervention can be in the language of choice of the intervener? It's not in the discretion of this person speaking as to which language they are addressed in. It's in the discretion of the intervener. Is that not the reality? And why do we need to equivocate about it? Why can't we have a ruling that that is what the, what the situation is? My understanding is that uh, anyone making an intervention can make it in any language they wish. At the end of the day, it is up to the person who's on their feet whether they wish to take that intervention. So, yeah. So, Neil McKenzie and Roche are all the same. That match and Italy, no one will say, no one will entire Agnami at the brass as the Dini and Mick Rory. A shop major and shop to lad the mean and all look, August and shake it function these for you, Ogini, Namara V River is there. Tomaji Clinton's initial real this in the Bratania, not match and a touch of a mock a GM Vlianer, Bedger. August Marial and Jilty on to EP Hack the Stack, so cool channel. Le Bonu, Le Partiella, Tashidic Blockel and Tarigit, Shinigola Maka and Doris, Ekjoldi Takiak, Mas, Augustinich, a Hasbrin Stagini, Tashika Foylik Jildi Tori and Tehen, a Glaku. Akanu and Ish is Federalin Dohus, a Hort Stagini, is Federalin Kyonkorla, Rauni, August Feminist, a Kruhu, is Federalin Tusa Karlisha Nubber, August and Shake Hate Function, a Kurish Daka Boki, Nanini, Shake Hate Font of Ero, Marlena Slandala, the Chowli, August Ebri. Time which frostal or our bubble light rock, August Gak Gilliginia, Fod Fad and Tushkirch. Tishin Fian Chumata, La Ober Son Gakdinia, August in Kianarak, a Tadi, a Hashbinch. Dirchmudge, August Tamajara Rish, Gwomage Ray, Co Ebri, La Partiella, a Tigiri, Sahi, Forasak, a Kruhu. Tabariak Damakurhamu, Eder Baldinia, August in La Tanuyon, Ni more than Will, Ni more than Classiak, Ni more than a Leishkilta, Janaki and Rugkart. Renegi Kyonkorla, August Ligigi, Dune, a Lig, Golamon, Ebra, or Son, and Fubble, and Ish. Thank you. I call Edwin Foots. Acting Speaker, um, today there's been a lot of statements made, um, but not a lot of fact behind uh, uh, a lot of, lot of what has been said. And we're in a circumstance today where we have uh, Michelle O'Neill, who walked out of her role as Health Minister. Not for, for six months, but for three years. Uh, whenever uh, Ben Go was there, whenever there was all the problems about nursing was actually led to, to the, the strike in 2019, and she abandoned her position, lecturing us about health. We have Conor Murphy lecturing us about what could be done. Whenever Michelle O'Neill was saying earlier this year, we have £420 million that we want to give to the public. That was uh, completely non-factual. In that, in that, Michelle O'Neill um, was claiming that there was £420 million to distribute while Colin Murphy was racking up a huge debt for the executive, a huge debt that will be passed on 
to next year's budget because the money did not exist. I will give way. Thank you, for giving way. Can I correct him on two points? Firstly, he knows when he talks about the three years that myself and himself agreed in February 2018 a deal to put this executive back in place. True. And he knows that his own party scuppered it over the weekend in which they would not announce the deal. He knows that. And also, as I pointed out in my contribution, it was for the executive to decide what to do with that £300 million. They could have put it all to, to, to deal with the overspend of departments, which was caused by the fact that we had no budget in place, or they could have used some or all of it to deal with cost of living and fair pay <laughs> awards. Crucially, it was for the executive to decide, and crucially, the DUP have prevented that from happening. Well, yes, and I welcome uh, Mr Murphy's intervention. First of all, he tells us that there was £300 million. Uh, which would indicate that Michelle O'Neill, Michelle O'Neill's quote, Michelle O'Neill's quote of 420 million w w was a fabricated one and, and didn't have any standing whatsoever. Secondly, secondly, now you, you know, well, I was happy to go away, Mr. Murphy, and, 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 and I'm ha happy to respond to your intervention. Uh, but clearly, Ms. O'Neill didn't have anything factual whenever she was claiming there was 420 million to give the public, and, and, and we had a circumstance where Sinn Féin repeated repeated months after months after months that there was hundreds of millions to give to the public when it didn't exist, yeah. whenever in reality Minister Murphy was racking up a debt, a debt that is going to be rolled into next year and will ensure that we have a difficult financial year next year. He also referred to the budget that was produced. I need to deal with the issues first. He referred to the budget that he produced. No party supported that budget. The Alliance Party didn't support it because it didn't cover police and prisons. Infrastructure didn't support it because it wouldn't allow them to do what they, the basics of what had to be done. Education didn't support it because he didn't provide what is statutorily necessary for special educational needs. Sinn Féin didn't care about the young people with special educational needs in that budget because they didn't provide for them in the budget. So we had a budget that wasn't supported by any other party uh, within the executive at that point in time. Ms, Ms Armstrong, she, she suggests that if we just get the Assembly back, the £600 will go out. That's, that is entirely, that is entirely Mr, Mr Acton Speaker, that is entirely disingenuous. Sorry, it was a point of order. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, I think that Hansard will record that the £600 will not, I said, be given out before Christmas, and I offered that it would be possible for us to get £400 out before Christmas as an electric um, credit and £200 after Christmas, but Hansard will be proof in fact of that. Yeah, I, don't really think, I don't really think that's a point of order, but the remarks have been noted. Uh, Mr. Pooch, you have the floor. Thank you for clarifying. It's not a point of order, and it was entirely disingenuous for, for Ms. Kelly to suggest that the assembly, that the assembly could, or, sorry, Ms. Armstrong, my apologies, that the assembly could in some way um, get this money out um, whenever it is a UK government responsibility. A UK government is distributed uh, in Scotland and in Wales, not through the Welsh Assembly, not through the Scottish Parliament. They are distributed directly. So let's be very clear: the money is sitting there. The capacity to spend the money exists and is for the UK government to do it because we have this, this nonsense. Well, 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 we'll call an election. That will push the DUP in, into do, doing this. Uh, we'll cut the pay. That will push the DUP into doing this. Uh, we'll, we'll, take, we'll keep the whole of the money back off. We know we'll have to give it to them, but we'll hold it back off the people. That will make them have to do it. Let me be very clear. This is a constitutional issue, and we will not be going back in for threats for bribes or anything else. We will be making our position absolutely clear. And to Ursula von der Leyen, who was here last week, I haven't got time, I'm sorry, but Ursula von der Leyen, who, who, who was in the Republic last week, who made some of the most ridiculous claims in terms of the British government, who have supported the Ukraine in a way that no other government in Europe has, and who never engaged in the activity that was suggested by Ursula von der Leyen, and in fact the only people outside of Russia who's doing a power grab is the European Union who want to make laws in this place when there is nobody democratically mandated to actually respond to those laws on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. So the European Union need to get the reality here. We will not be giving in on these issues. We will be, we will be standing firm on it. I want to briefly mention Mr Beattie's comments because I think it is absolutely scandalous what he has done. And apologies don't cut it, Doug. Because whenever you're a repeat offender, repeat apologies don't cut it. I just repeat what he said. 
I know you think you can scream and whinge and whine like a girl from the sidelines. That's up to you. I know personally what it's like, Mr Beatty, to be on the receiving end of your tweets and messages. I know personally what it's like for a woman to be on the receiving end. I know what it's personally what it's like for a woman's children to be on the receiving end of that, and you're a disgrace to unionism. I call order. I'd just like to raise the point of order, Mr Acting Speaker, under point 65 in relation to some of the language that was used earlier, which I think the last speaker has referred to. I was going to wait to the end, but I think the time is now appropriate to raise this. I understand that the member did withdraw their remarks. However, it is incumbent upon all members of this Assembly to be dignified in their use of language and to ensure that it is reflective of the whole community. Obviously, that fell short on this occasion, but I would also like to reference, Mr Acting Speaker, your reluctance to say people can say what they want or words to that effect. It is incumbent not on just us, but you in the chair to make a ruling and to say what language is appropriate. And I would like to hear a ruling on that, Mr Acting Speaker. I just remind the member that you, you really don't have the authority to challenge uh, the ruling of the chair. Uh, I had requested earlier and made it very clear I was asking for people to act with dignity and respect. And I think that we should all just, just act on that basis and continue to act on that basis. Uh, my function here today as an acting speaker is quite limited. My powers are quite limited. And if any member feels that there is something that they want to take up further, uh, I would advise that they should contact directly the Speaker uh, and take it up uh, with the Speaker. Thank you. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order. So I would just like to clarify that yes, we will. Be following up on writing. However, I also wish to log for the record today that I do think it is disappointing that a simple statement from the chair could not have been made in respect of those comments. And for the record, I rise to say that that language is unparliamentary. Women do belong in this chamber, and in fact, in every meeting where decisions are made, and I would like that to be heard for the whole House. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I have no doubt that the Speaker will make a ruling on that if you bring it to his attention. Thank you. Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Um, before I begin my remarks, I would just like to place on record my deepest sympathies to the family of Stella Lilly McCorkendale. I am sure they are devastated by her loss this week through the Strep A infection. And I would also like to thank the Public Health Agency, the GPs, the community pharmacists and the school leaders for their swift responses to this health emergency. Mr Acting Speaker, I rise to urge all members in this chamber today to elect a Speaker. I will be blunt. I do not care which Speaker is elected. But we do need a Speaker and we need an Assembly. There is only one party blocking the election of a Speaker and yet even by its own logic shows we need to elect one. The DUP sought an amendment recently in the Executive Formation Bill at second reading in Parliament seeking to give MLAs scrutiny rights of what permanent secretaries were doing. DUP MLAs can in fact deliver that scrutiny right here, right now, by electing a Speaker. They always could. The fact is that the DUP's desperate quest for leverage by refusing to elect a Speaker is not just causing material harm to households not receiving payments during an energy crisis, it is also imperiling one of the very institutions cited as a reason for unionism to exist, namely the National Health Service. The failure to take the time to pass relevant legislation to allow the transformation of our health service to proceed and the failure to communicate to the public why such reforms are necessary has seen a calamity unfold in our health and social care system, not least in recent weeks. So we now have a service which is often inaccessible, 
accompanied by diagnostics or treatment which can take many years or, in, or are ineffective or effectively unavailable in many branches of medicine. While money is spent on public inquiries and severe adverse incident reviews whose recommendations go pretty much unimplemented, as a result, patient safety is compromised and improvement is rarely truly sought, <coughs> leading to an endless cycle of more inquiries and reviews, more scandals and more quests for justifiable redress, but no significant transformation of the service. The fact is, many of the failings do go back to previous devolved administrations. The DUP itself often held health and finance ministries at the same time, failing to embrace reform and the need to fund it and resource it adequately. As Bengoa, Donaldson, Compton and all the others warned us, healthcare provision is changing around the world. Services are much more specialised, conditions are much more complex and medicines are much more specific than was the case even a decade ago. What was required was a consistent transformation programme with clearly measurable outcomes and clarity about why any of these outcomes had been missed. Instead, what we have had since 2017, since Bengoa, are protracted periods of political stalemate. As a result, we now see some reconfigurations of services being carried out as a panicked response rather than a planned programme. The supposed jewel in the crown of the Union, the NHS, is on its knees in Northern Ireland. Our health and social care workers are struggling as best they can to keep it upright, noting as well that they are long overdue pay rises that an executive needs to sign off. Perhaps people do not believe that Stormont would sort this out. What I know is that it will not be sorted out without Stormont, without ministerial direction, local accountability, democratic scrutiny and legislative intervention. Those who vote to elect a speaker are voting to begin the process of turning our health and social care service around and giving the public the care, support and treatment they need, not least in this time of economic uncertainty. Those who do not vote to elect a speaker are voting to crash and burn public health care provision here in Northern Ireland. That is the choice for all of us here today. Let us be in no doubt about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Uh, it is extremely disappointing that we find ourselves here for the fifth time since each of us were democratically elected in May. And what is even more depressing is watching some of the antics across this House, particularly some of the language used by members of the DUP. I was democratically elected as an MLA to the Northern Ireland Assembly to represent the constituents of West Tyrone in May, uh, Mr Acting Speaker. My right, democratic right, as an elected member of this House has been blocked and blocked by one party alone, the DUP. They are preventing me and others in this House from representing and standing up for the needs of our constituents right across every single constituency in Northern Ireland. It would do some members well to remember why we stand election to begin with. We stand election, I would hope, to better the lives of our constituents in whatever way possible. How on earth, Mr Acting Speaker, is this situation in any way improving the lives of any of our constituents? The DUP know, as does anybody in Northern Ireland, with ears and eyes, that the DUP have no influence over the negotiations with the EU and the British government. Zero. That I will give way. The member will have noted, like I did, the remarks of Mr. Putz across the chamber on, on double standards. Will he have seen, like I did, the reports of the correspondence that Mr Putz sent to the British Government while he was still Agriculture Minister, uh, saying that he wanted parts of the protocol to be retained for the benefit of farmers? <coughs> Would he, do you think he should account for that double standard in relation to the protocol that the DUP so bemoaned today? I thank the member for intervention. Du duplicity. important to clarify something whenever, whenever um, uh, an untruth is being peddled. I, th I, think, I think it's absolutely important. 
that, that Order. nothing of the protocol was asked to be kept, that the maximisation of, of, of the United Kingdom's government's ability to support business in Northern Ireland uh, should be availed of um, in legislation. I think that was a point of order, but uh, the member's remarks have been noted. Sorry. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. It would do no surprise that the first three letters of duplicity is D-U-P, and you're never found wanting when it comes to that narrative. The reality for the people in this House, and we've heard reality said by our colleagues across these benches, the reality is that people are starving. People cannot heat their homes. People cannot afford to travel to their work. People cannot afford to live who are going out working tirelessly in our hospitals, in our schools, in the public domain every single day. Every single day, and you know it. Because I would like to think that you are hearing the exact same things that I am hearing from our constituents. Either that or your office doors maybe are locked or your phone lines are disconnected. Because I can tell you, the people that are ringing me and other members of this House are absolutely sick, sore and tired of being failed by this place. Failed. And I am ashamed ashamed to stand in this House, ashamed to stand in this House, prevented from exercising my democ democratic right and standing up for every citizen. I have heard the members say Const a constitu the Constitution comes first. The member would do well, Mr Acting Speaker, to follow me to Alton Galvin Hospital and stand in the A&E and look at people suffering with mental health issues that can't get a bed in the, in the facilities in Derry or anywhere else, would do well to look at the person that is dying on a hospital seat that can't get a bed. Because I can tell you, Mr Acting Speaker, if Mr Putz wants to go into the uh, A&E in Alton Galvin and say, folks, it's constitution first, you can all die. That's the message you're sending. That's the message you're sending. You're also sending, I will not give way, you've said enough, Mr Alistair, you, the, 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 the real leader of the DUP has spoken. That's where your narrative comes out of. Mr Acting Speaker, this is about real life. I am frustrated. It can be seen in how I speak and what I am saying today. People in our constituencies are suffering incredibly, incredibly. And I would ask, Mr Speaker, and I would appeal, I would appeal to the members opposite to search within themselves and ask, do you really think it is appropriate to allow people to suffer or use them as leverage to get what you want, when the reality is you have no influence whatsoever. In fact, you truly destroyed that bridge when you were propping up Theresa May's government and polishing the red bus. But the reality, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, I've heard this session today called a farce. My democratic right as an elected member of this House is not a farce. It is not a farce. My right to represent my constituents is not a farce. Is it a farce, Mr Lyons? I ask Mr Lyons, Mr Acting Speaker, is it a farce to suggest that children starving is farcical? That we, that we Mr. Mr Acting Speaker, could resolve in this House? And I hear time and time again members of the DUP continually say on radio, but we really couldn't do anything about it if the Assembly was here. Why stand in action? Where's your sense of hope? Where's your sense of aspiration? Because, you see, for young emerging unionists, if that's the vision for this place, if that's the vision for this place, they won't want to be a part of it. I represent every single citizen in my constituency, every one of them. I've yet to hear one of them say, I've yet to hear one of them say, the, pre the protocol is their biggest issue. Is their biggest issue. It's not. The DUP don't like the truth, Mr. Acting Speaker. But I can tell you, and my appeal to the people of Northern Ireland is this. Knock on the doors of the DUP. Ring their phones email them, bombard their social media, tell them your children are starving, tell them you can't heat your homes, tell them you can't fund your business, because the reality is the DUP know it, you're in a very bad position, you're wrong and you're failing people. And the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland would do very well, Mr Acting Speaker, to remember. Emma, Bring your remarks failed. to a conclusion, the please. The DUP have failed and they have failed every citizen in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Podrick uh, Delargy. Every single household in the north is going to be £600 worse off this Christmas because one party refused to go on the government, refused to do their job and refused to come back in and end their boycott of this assembly and this executive. One party which refused to accept the democratic will of the people of the north, who refused to come back to work with the Nationalist First Minister, who refused to do their jobs and who refuse to help the rest of us here to put money back in the people's pockets. Well, I would say to them, I refuse 
to stop standing up for ordinary people, because I will continue to do that, as will my party and as will the other parties here. We will stand up for ordinary people. We will stand up for workers. We will stand up for families right across the north. So what I would say to you today is to form an executive today, to come back around the table with the rest of us, and to help work together to give people that £600 payment. Let's deliver for people, because that is our job. Weeks ago, the former economy minister promised people that they were going to get this payment in November, but now we find out that that had absolutely no basis. We also heard the DUP's five-point plan. No. We also heard the DUP's five-point plan to invest an extra billion pounds in health, to give 30 hours free childcare, and to keep schools world class. I would love to know how the DUP intend to do any of that without an executive. Last Friday, I sat at the Disability Parliament and I heard from deaf and disabled people right across the north about how they are struggling day in, day out. Their harrowing experiences that they have gone through and the plethora of practical solutions which we can help to make. What do they want us to do? They want us to get back in here and to get an executive form. I also listened to the Children's Commissioner who stated, this is 2022 and we are worried about children dying of hypothermia. What does she want us to do? She wants us to get back in here and to form an executive. I've listened to people right across Derry, right across the North, day in, day out, who are telling us that they are in dire straits, that they are struggling, that they need emergency financial support. And guess what they're telling us? To get back in here and to get an executive form. So you can choose today not to listen to me. You can choose not to listen to my party, any of the other parties on here. But do not sit there and choose to ignore the people who elected you, who will go cold, who will go hungry this winter. Because the refusal to go under government is an act of gross political and financial negligence, and it needs to end now. I call Robbie Butler. It doesn't look like he'll be speaking nice today, um, Mr. Free. Um, I wasn't going to speak, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, but my heart's literally thumping, genuinely is thumping. Um, it's thumping with a myriad of emotions. Um, the first one is the reason we're here to debate, and that is the state that Northern Ireland's in, the country that, that I love dearly and deeply, uh, the country that I gave up the job that I did to come and represent and to represent as a proud unionist, and I would just put any unionist in this chamber on warning not to challenge me on the depth of my commitment to unionism, the union and the United Kingdom. Don't dare do that. Do not, do not chunter and reduce any unionist desire and passion uh, on the constitutional issue. But in reality, uh, Mr Speaker, um, yesterday I got a, a message from a lady that I know, and, and she works, her husband doesn't work. And this lady has quite a number of children. Now, I'm not going to say how many children that she has because it would identify her. She has a large family. And she approached me uh, for food, food vouchers. Um, and I, I was able to direct her to the, the local food bank. And that of itself was, was sad enough. This lady tries to work very hard to provide for her family. Um, shortly after that, I think the lady got the courage um, to message me and ask me, did, did I know of anybody that could help or would help? with fuel because she was down to the fumes in her oil tank. She doesn't get paid until the 16th of December. And I, I directed her to some agencies that I'm aware of who may or may not be able to provide help. I, I listened to much of the debate. Um, there was a the, the member from North Down. Um, I actually think he spoke very well. Um, some of the points he was making were, were re reasonably good, but they weren't fully accurate if you take what he was saying right to the end um, of what he was saying. He was talking about the hypocrisy. Uh, that is being ex exposed in this chamber today, and there is hypocrisy being exposed in this chamber today, particularly from the party opposite, because this, this chamber obviously was held uh, out for three years. Some will debate the, the rationale and the reasons for that. But what I do know is, and, 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 and you know this because I speak on mental health and suicide prevention all the time, is that when you inflict trauma on anyone, the lasting effects of that trauma go on for years. Happen for years. In fact, some of, the, some of those things don't actually emerge until many months or years later. 
And I suspect in years to come that we'll look back in those three years and we will be able to pinpoint the effect that the fact that that had on people's lives here in Northern Ireland, whether it was the failure to deliver or to start Bingo and have it running at the speed that it should have, whether it was the transformation of business and opportunities, whether it was the chance to have it ch uh, chatting here and, and speaking about here about Brexit and the impact of Brexit, because we didn't have that. But we run the risk of doing the very same again. My colleagues to the right of me need to consider this and need to take this into consideration, as does my colleague to the left, um, Mr Allister. I would urge unionists to hold themselves to a higher station and understand that, yes, the Constitution is important, but the Constitution will be, the, will be won on seats in this chamber, and political representation, political representation will come from people believing you represent them in the moment that they're in and the things that matter to them. And I fear at the moment, with the pressures that are on families, like the lady that spoke to me or messaged me yesterday, I'm not going to take any interventions, Mr Alistair, and I mean that most uh, kindly and, and uh, appropriately, but there are deep fissures in this chamber, and one of them emerged today when I asked for an intervention from the member from West Belfast. And the reason it was given that the intervention wouldn't be taken is because I, wouldn't, I wasn't able to ask it in Irish. Now, as someone who would many would describe as a moderate unionist, and someone who actually brought an amendment to a, a, a bill here with, with regard to translation, I'm deeply disappointed, and I'm not going to labour it too much because it's not the most important thing today. But on the day that that bill gets royal Irish, a royal scent, the Irish language gets royal scent, and then to be treated like that in, in my chamber. I, 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 I'm, I'm genuinely grieved for the future of this place, but I'm just going to end on this. The decision by the DUP and, and their partner in the TV will not be made in this chamber. There's nobody with the authority to my right to influence the, the DUP in that regard. The leader isn't here, uh, and those that are they're speaking to him obviously aren't here. I just urge you to not repeat the, the, the sins of the past, because that trauma will be measured in years to come, guys. And uh, I, I want you to just to reevaluate for the sake of unionism. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As uh, no other members have indicated to speak, uh, the question will now be put. Point of order. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, would you be able to confirm today that the votes of the MLAs who designate as other, rather than the MLAs who designate as unionists and nationalists, will carry less weight than the MLAs who designate as unionists and nationalists? Thank you. Northern Ireland Act sets out a mechanism for that, uh, so I think that answers your question really. So I'm going to put the question. The question is that Mike Nesbitt be Speaker of this Assembly. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. Thank you.
Order, order. Uh, members, please resume your seats. The question is that Mike Nesbitt be elected as Speaker of the Assembly. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary of any, no. no. Do we have tellers? Order, order members, order, order please. Tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Robbie Butler and Steve Aiken. Tellers for the nose are Alan Robinson and Diane Forsyth. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Thank you.
Secure the doors. Order, order. Uh, clerk, uh, read the result, please. 48 members voted, of which 24 voted aye, 50%. One nationalist vote, voted, of which zero, zero voted aye, 0%. 30 unionists voted, of which seven voted aye, 23.3%. 17 others voted, of which 17 voted aye, 100%. Six members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The motion falls. The nomination has fallen. So unfasten the doors, please. The question has not been agreed. The question now shall be put in relation to the second candidate. The question is that Patsy McGlone be Speaker of this Assembly. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. No. Aye. I have been advised by the party whips in accordance with Standing Order 27 1A B that there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers?
Order, please. Tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Callum McGrath and Cara Hunter, and tellers for the, no the nose are Alan Robinson and Diane Forsyth. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Secure the doors.
Order, order. Members, please resume your seats. Clerk, read your result, please. 74 members voted, of which 50 voted aye, 67.6%. 32 nationalists voted, of which 32 voted aye, 100%. 25 unionists voted, of which one voted aye, 4%. 17 others voted, of which 17 voted aye, 100%. Five members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The nomination falls. The nomination falls. On fasten the doors. Point of order. Point of order. A genuine point of order. In the recently passed and received Royal Assent Bill at Westminster, delaying an election and taking the power to cut MLA pay, there is a specific reference to consultation between elected members of this Assembly and the British Government in terms of the, uh, in terms of the operation of powers in this interim period. Would it be in order for the Speaker's Office to give clarity to members here as to what exactly their understanding is of what that provision in the new legislation means? Further to that, would it also be in order for the Speaker's Office to write to the UK Government to get, provide members of this duly elected assembly, which still exists, we are still MLAs, to give us an urgent update on the progress of discussions between the UK and EU. I would hope that both of those points of order that I've raised would find some agreement across uh, this assembly. But as uh, acting speaker, my responsibility is limited to overseeing the election of a speaker today. So points of order in relation to any other matters uh, should be raised uh, with the Speaker through the Speaker's office. So the Assembly has been unable to elect a Speaker today and the Assembly has been unable to conduct its first business. Therefore, we can proceed no further. Any further sittings of the Assembly can only be held to first elect a Speaker and Deputy Speakers. Under Section 39.2 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, the current Speaker remains in office until a successor is elected. I therefore propose by leave of the Assembly to adjourn the sitting until a future date, the details of which will be communicated to members in due course. The question is that the Assembly do not adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound.